had a late lunch. No, I didn't want to eat before before I lecture. I'm right there. I got it. You're, you're sweet. Thanks. Nice. No. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we still have a few people grabbing their lunch, and I don't want them to feel rushed, but I do want us to get started because a number of our distinguished guests um, have to duck out early, and we want them to get the, as much as possible Dr. Burkle's presentation. I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco. I direct the Environmental Change and Security Program and coordinate our Global Health Initiative here at the Center. And it's a thrill for us today to be having the last in a series of, I believe, six or seven meetings in what we've been calling our Population Health and Fragility Series, a program that is done um, with the support of and in collaboration with USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. It's one where we largely focus this audience with an AID audience and an and a AID um, CA's audience, uh, a bit more narrow than a number of the meetings we have at the center, but really to have a focused discussion and provide um, a variety of per perspectives from both scholars and practitioners to this group and allow you to talk about how to make sense of the links among these issues, links that um, in some places perhaps are clear and other places are more difficult to tease out, and certainly on a set of issues that um, the agency and the government uh, and those who are, are working with the government are grappling with in so many places around the world, and so critical in terms of priorities um, and uh, certainly issues in the headlines, shall we say. Um, allow me just a word about the Wilson Center uh, and the Environmental Change and Security Program. As I think many of you know, the Wilson Center is the formal memorial to Woodrow Wilson, a nonpartisan, non-advocacy institution to facilitate exactly this kind of dialogue between scholars and practitioners. The Environmental Change and Security Program is a 12-year-old program that tries to do that in a specific area of population health, environment, and development issues in, and put those together with uh, broader foreign policy, security policy, uh, issues of conflict and cooperation. And so we really touch a lot of those bases with today's session, and so we're, we're thrilled um, to have this important topic, Measuring the Human Cost of War, Dilemmas and Controversies. But we're especially pleased to have uh, Dr. Skip Burkle um, to share his thoughts with us. As many of you in this room know, as a former colleague of Dr. Burkle's, he's someone who really, it's fair to say, has a, a unique perspective given the diversity of his, his, um, his postings and works in the field and such. And so we're really just, we're really just thrilled to have him um, as, a, as a capstone for this series, something that we recognized months ago would be a good idea. And so. It's terrific that um, while he was on this coast, he was willing to um, he's willing to make some time and come down and and join us. Um, I've, we've handed out a speaker bio, and I won't list the kind of extensive set of records, other than to say that Dr. Burkle is, is now a visiting professor in the Center for Disaster and Refugee Studies at the Schools of Medicine and Public Health at Johns Hopkins, also senior lecturer at Harvard, the Humanitarian Initiative at the Harvard School of Public Health. Um, notably for some of the um, topics that we'll be addressing today, formerly served as senior medical and public health advisor to the Defense Threat Reduction Agency of the U.S. Government and Deputy Assistant Administrator USAID's uh, Department of State Bureau for Global Health. So um, as we can see, uh, really in the midst of some, uh, some tough work, uh, and, but somebody who has both the um, uh, experience of senior administrator back here and somebody with a field based as well as the medical background. Um, so we're really thrilled to have him um, share with us his, his thoughts today and then look forward to the, the conversation afterwards. I will say just one quick word when we get to the Q&A, and particularly I ask that you um, use one of the microphones because we are um, uh, taping this for the webcast and video, so we want to capture your questions. So please, Dr. Burkle. Jeff, thank you. Well, it's a real honor to be asked to speak at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and uh, an extra honor to meet all many of my colleagues from USAID. I didn't expect this, and it was very nice because I haven't, haven't uh, seen all of you since I resigned from that august uh, uh, body over there. So uh, thank you for coming. You know, um, earlier, uh, Paul, I'm not sure Paul here, he was doing all the AV stuff, but was hooking me up to this, uh, not a remote la la lavalier, but one that I'm, I'm tied in umbilical cord. But while he was doing it, I was trying to, I was 
thinking, uh, gee, what, what can I talk about that is both public health, because I'm going to talk about public health, but public health in a much broader sense that, than you usually think about it, because we're in an era of public health, and, and believe it or not, tie it to lavaliers. Um, I don't know whether you guys have any connections, but I certainly remember one. And this was about uh, 12 years ago at the Hilton Hawaiian Village, if any of you have been to Hawaii, big conference center. And um, back then, the lavaliers uh, were um, just new, and they were rather testy, and they always had problems. It would just go off for some reason, things like that. But what you would do when you were a speaker is you sort of stood at attention, and the AV people, there were always two, one connecting you here, one doing this, one to turn the thing on and off and all the rest of the stuff. Actually, it's coming, coming apart for me here. Um, yeah. But um, uh, hopefully that'll work. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but anyways, so it's like this, but much worse. So this was a big international conference. As a matter of fact, they took two big conference halls and um, uh, combined them. So there were something like 700, 800 speakers. And so the the keynote speaker, I will not mention his name, but he was quite prominent in the field. Um, and they stood him there at attention and hooked everything up and whatever. And um, then the uh, preliminaries about, you know, where the little boy's um, room is and the little girl's room and the breaks and all the rest of the stuff. With that, he said to himself, gee, I, I need to go to the men's room. <laughs> so he went to the men's room, not realizing <laughs> that, the, that the microphone was on. So for the next five minutes or so, 700-plus uh, people heard every single sound. And he rushes back, as they're giving the introduction, to a hush crowd and some people pointing because every all 700-plus people realized that he had not washed his hands. <laughs> he gave actually a, an excellent speech, but his evaluations were extremely poor. <laughs> So I think the message here is that, you know, uh, public health is important to people, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> among other things, and we'll talk about it. Um, see, the, be sure this worked. Yeah, uh, the objectives. First off, I want to be sure that we have a level ground here, and that. So I'm just going to quickly define what we uh, talk about in terms of direct or indirect deaths. The indirect aspect is what I'm going to talk about because it's emerging. It's emerging a lot. It has a lot to do with fragile states countries in crisis and all the rest, somewhat contentious. But to give a level ground, I'm just going to briefly run through three epidemiologic models of what we've been seeing. And one of the handouts is there. It's from a, from a journal that was published a, a while back. But as a preliminary to what I was saying is, is part two, because I want to really look at and discuss with you the challenges of measuring the human cost of war. And uh, some of the dilemmas, controversies, lessons learned, let me tell you, there's more of those than things that are really straight and understood by, by everybody. So it should hopefully provoke some degree of discussion. We all know about complex emergencies. I've never seen a term that has been uh, defined uh, more than that has. Uh, but I'll simply say it's, it's uh, uh, politically motivated disasters. It's also been called, I think, well uh, as a, uh, complex political disasters, but in which there's obviously high levels of violence and lots of civilian deaths. Interesting thing is, you know, even a lot of the things that have been happening in, our, in Iraq, conventional approaches to war and whatever. But cross-border wars, uh, we certainly know an awful lot about uh, about World War I and World War II, but since that time we've really had internal wars, haven't we? And uh, uh, recognition with the turn of the century that actually more people have died from internal wars than they have from cross-border wars. A lot of people not knowing that. One of the big problems we have, and it does impact how we measure human cross of war, is the fact that the UN Charter, written in 1945, which deals with cross-border wars, um, really is quite outmoded and uh, doesn't have genocide or mass slaughter or anything in the, in the language of the charter. Um, doesn't have peacekeeping and peace enforcement in there at all either. Um, we certainly trash the, the UN, 
but uh, you know the the Kofi Annans, the Butrus Gales, and the De Cuellars really are uh, all they do is they administer a, a charter. They have very very little in the way of authority or or means to change everything. So um, you know what's really, and I just don't hear en enough about it, but. The UN has never had a chance to reform the, the charter, uh, but it's here now, and if it's not reformed properly, uh, we're not going to have another chance for at least another 50 years or so. Um, but uh, it really, if it isn't reformed in the right direction, uh, the UN indeed might might indeed uh, disappear as, as as we know it. So a lot of critical things are are going on, and hopefully um, we'll include, uh, you know, mass slaughter. <laughs> Uh, internal conflict and, and genocide, among other things. But, you know, primarily our emphasis, especially for intervention in these complex emergencies, has been battlefield deaths. I mean, it's sexy. Everybody hears about it. I mean, that's right at the tip of our tongue with everything goes on in Iraq. And yet we don't hear about all these background things, a lot of which we uh, put under the uh, bailiwick of indirect kinds of situations. As mortality def uh, declines, so does aid, so does interest, okay? Current assumptions are that indeed, you know, with uh, actually pretty low cost uh, uh, care, aid, we can reduce a lot of the problems we see at the time of intervention to pre-war levels or better within four to six months. So let's just talk about measuring direct and indirect deaths. Uh, obviously, just to summarize, you know, you land, you look, you walk, you talk. And very soon we start doing something, some, some semblance of population-based cluster samples. I mean, that is what we've come to. Certainly the, the indicators that, that we're tied to, uh, you know, you think, you hear about infant mortality rates, maternal mor mortality rates, that's hard to get. It's not something that we can measure, and sometimes there's a lot of political and tribal and other reasons to do it. But underage five mortality rates, crude mortality rates, which, you know, the term you, you, you know, have to remember is that if you disaggregate for age and gender your crude mortality rates, that's your first step into understanding the vulnerable populations, right? You know, who is, who's vulnerable and who's not. And then what's um, been popular and more and more in the press is the excess mortality rates. Uh, excess mortality rates started in the Congo. Um, the methodology is the same. But a lot of political fervor because that, the, that's the basis for the Iraq mortality studies. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But everybody uses health indicators. First off, they are the most sensitive. You probably remember when Albania happened, okay, and everybody was surprised from the State Department and all the, uh, the ways in which you can uh, uh, pre uh, predict these things. Everybody was surprised by Albania. But in retrospect, when you look back at the different indicators, um, of the political violence, of rising political violence until it became, uh, the world became aware of it, the most uh, sensitive indicators were the health indicators. Mm -hmm. So as political violence increases, whether it's in, in, uh, in Albania or uh, Palestine or, or East Timor or whatever, uh, uh, people who have children or elderly people ill, that the, the window of opportunity to seek care just narrows and narrows and narrows with curfews and all the rest. Well, the way it shows this ugly head is that, that inextricably uh, mortality and morbidity rates begin to, to go up. So for months ahead of time, worsening, worsening health indices predicted that this uh, Albania was going to become more than just a political, uh, political uh, violence situation. But here is something that the UN uh, uses, and as you can see here, it's percentage of nations that are actually, that's the end numbers of all the different countries that are in conflict. And as, a, as the uh, no, uh, violence goes up, and looking here, uh, uh, the underage five mortality rate goes up. So, he, uh, you know, People tend to bastardize a lot the, the health indicators, and we could probably have, have a lot of lessons learned here whether this is valid or not. But we do know that as violence increases, so does the underage five mortality rate. Okay? So uh, everybody uses health indicators. The great majority of losses, however, the deaths are really from indirect deaths or excess mortality. 
And again, these are deaths that would not have occurred without the conflict due to breakdown of social and health services, mass displacement, whether they're internally displaced or refugees crossing borders, and just the impossibility of maintaining um, some semblance of, of, uh, of uh, anything uh, that you would call livelihood. Uh, the other thing is we always talk about collateral damage, uh, the, the, what's placed upon civilians um, uh, because of, of weapons of war. But indeed, from m my colleagues in the humanitarian community, for quite a while now, we do see indirect deaths as a form of collateral damage. And I think there's a lot uh, to go for, uh, for uh, supporting that. Uh, except for very few countries, just a handful really, the humanitarian community has a absolutely no idea of the worldwide impact of indirect deaths. We don't have any good data sets. No one's held accountable for it. And uh, indirect deaths, um, for the most part, politically remain uh, unseen, uncounted, and unnoticed. The contributing factors, probably seen this before, but the direct effects that we see from, from a, a conflict, the injuries, the illnesses, the deaths. Uh, we added a, probably about a decade ago the human rights abuses, abuses from international law, the psychological problems. But it's the indirect effects that, uh, that cause most of the problems. So any there from a population displacement, uh, disruption of food, health facilities as a rule in all complex emergencies are the first to be destroyed and the last to recover. Uh, destroyed public health infrastructure and certainly destroyed livelihoods. But also you must add to this, and this is ex uh, it's extremely strong in terms of contributing more to mortality, morbidity, but a lethal mix of anything from inequities and poverty to religious fundamentalism. And this, uh, all of it adversely affects the public health and leads to mortality and morbidity. Uh, it's, in, it's difficult or impossible to measure, but it's certainly there and something that we have to take into the equation. In ways, I'm also trying to define for you what complex emergencies are about. They, they, they are all about all of this that happens internally. Epidemiologic models, uh, we can, I think, safely, but all, although the three models really are like Venn diagrams, and so there's some overlap. But developing country model, I mean, that's the one you all remember, and the Somalias, and the Angolas, and Sierra Leone's, and Liberia's. Developed country models, former Yugoslavia, Chechnya, Iraq, and then the chronic smoldering ones that are sort of a combination of everything that go on for years. You know, Sudan is now, what, almost 60 years, Palestine, Haiti. At one time, we're were um, uh, uh, a developing country model, but it's different, and, and we'll talk about that, and we have to think about it. So looking at the developing country model, the health profile, we'll go and we'll do surveys and, and assessments and all the rest of the stuff and find out how severe all of this, but gee, the way we plan, the way we go forward, yes, we're always going to see severe malnutrition, outbreaks of communicable diseases, which are, core, of course, all uh, things that are endemic, Crude, high crude mortality rates until we disaggregate it for age and gender. And high case fatality rates, which is very important because if you go to a place like Somalia, the infectious disease that caused most of the deaths were measles. I'm sure if I asked many of you whether they had the measles, you raise your hand. Uh, and it's just a bothersome kind of thing. Uh, and if we had a measles outbreak because we didn't have any vaccinations here in the D.C. area, probably the mortality rates would be less, certainly less than 1%. But we're talking about figures of 81%, uh, 53% uh, in various studies. But what, what it is is children who are starving and adults who are starving. And so any kind of infectious disease, so an acute respiratory infection turns into pneumonia, measles turns into meningoencephalitis, uh, malaria turns into an encephalitis and, and black water fever and things like that. So we have high case fatality rates and of course no public health infrastructure, very little existing before but very little do we remain. Mortality rates 7 to 70 times the baseline but if indeed we have uh, orphans or unaccompanied uh, uh, children, uh, their mortality rates are 200 to 800 times the baseline. Okay? And as they all come into a refugee camp, you think uh, the few adults, usually only mothers, with lots of these kids. Once they get into the camps, uh, you know, 
you're not going to distribute food to each individual child. You distribute it to a mother thinking that then she will distribute it to the kids. So it's only then, after a number of days, that then you find out that there's, like in Somalia, 30,000, uh, Rwanda, another 70,000 unaccompanied children or orphans. Communicable disease, we already talked about that, but they account for the 75% of all the epidemics that we're seeing in the world today. And again, everything we see is about 90% preventable. We also have to work, and this is important to understanding indirect deaths. This is the, after, actually when I left USAID, I went as a senior medical advisor f to Liberia. But um, uh, this is just a, uh, uh, the outbreak of cholera. Now cholera we can diagnose fairly easily, although for a while it might, might look somewhat like dysentery as it did in, in, in Rwanda. But uh, yes, this indicates we've got a problem and we see a lot of other people. But the number of indirect deaths, we don't know because these are just the, the, the figures from a few MSF clinics. So the majority of people who have it out there, we don't know and they don't get into any data sets. Another thing too is, for those of you who have some clinical background, you appreciate this, but this is part of the infrastructure problem. The graph on the bottom is essentially malaria cases confirmed by laboratory. Even just a, a gram stain to say, oh, we, we've got some parasites here. And the top one is the number of cases of malaria then uh, that were diagnosed uh, just by clinical means. But everybody here that's a clinician will recognize that malaria looks like everything else, okay? Uh, are we missing typhoid fever? Are we missing meningitis? Are we missing pneumonia, okay? So in any data set, you know, this may be skewed in a direction that's, that's indeed not valid. We talk about uh, countries that are assessment challenged, and indeed Congo has been one. Few demographics, hostile territory, lots of people moving around. If you remember what happened back there in, uh, in 2001, we actually lost about $150,000, 50,000 50, people uh, under, um, under the cover of the jungles. I mean, we didn't know where the heck they went. We were looking for, for countries that had some satellite things to pick up where bodies might be moving, okay? But this is where we first started to use the excess mortality, okay? And uh, because we're not dealing with a population sample, okay, um, as, a, as a denominator, remember most of what we do, and a lot of people who are tied to epidemiology and statistics and, and all the rest of the stuff and haven't worked internationally, but essentially uh, what we do internationally is we, we have a bunch of numerators looking for denominators, okay? And that's frustrating for people who really demand much more stringency than that. But um, the best you can come out with is is, is a, a, a judgment, okay? So here are 2.5 million deaths, but look at the confidence inf intervals. The real value can be anywhere between 2 million and 4 million, okay? Um, and uh, 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 probably the, the most critical of this data that revealed is that 10%, only 10% of the deaths were from, the, from uh, uh, weaponry. The machine guns you hear about and see about on the news and everything else like that. So 90% of all the deaths, which are unseen and don't get much in the way of political attention, are indeed preventable. But it's this kind of data when you explain it, and the same thing happened with the Iraq mortality study, is it's so complex and it goes over people's heads. But when you, and this is what we had to do to explain it to the, to the UN. What this really, for the four months that it was done, really translates into 75% of the children born during 2001 will die before the age of two years. So the policymakers then say, ah, okay, now I understand, all right? So it does tell us that, you know, what we do in a lot of these studies, um, uh, even physicians uh, and other healthcare workers have, have hard times understanding it. So we can talk among ourselves, but unless it really does impact policy and make some sense, how do we translate this in simple speak uh, to, to those people who know it? Developing country model, like the Iraqs and um, Chechnya and other current relatively healthy populations with baseline demographics that are very similar to us in the United States and other Western countries. We don't see those uh, case fatality rates and uh, high crude mortality rates from infectious diseases. Matter of fact, this is more trauma related because these are countries that have advanced weaponry. 
all right? Above a level one if you see that at all, but that's what really you, you get. And then uh, where it's been done, and I'll give you one example, if you disaggregate for age and gender, uh, what we see in all these situations is that then, uh, whether it's females um, uh, being raped, so elderly people, patriarchs that are being eliminated, draft age males or whatever, uh, then are revealed, but during the times of ethnic cleansing. What we do see, however, is um, um, excess mortality from untreated chronic diseases. Uh, these are people who are not getting their insulin. They're no longer getting their high blood pressure medication, okay? Um, you know, actually very, very uh, good medical care in the former Yugoslavia. Now, I'm 67 years old, and I remember when we didn't have medication for high blood pressure. And so when somebody came into an ER, and it was always filled, but you would do a spinal tap to see if there's any fresh blood, and then we didn't have anything, medications, didn't have CAT scans, and so you put them up on the ward, and if they lived... Great, if they didn't, you know, that was it. Well, now, you know, uh, we jump on them with space age kind of medicine and all the rest of the stuff, but a lot of it happened when, when uh, high blood pressure medication became good. So what we saw, my generation of emergency physicians saw that less and less people were coming into the hospitals to stroke. Same thing with Yugoslavia, an observation that all the physicians made. But as soon as the war started and medication was not coming into the country, same thing with Iraq too, all of a sudden all these fresh cases of people coming in with strokes, coming in diabetic ketoacidosis and whatever. The other thing is, oh, a lot of children and families left for Europe and whatever, but the elderly people stayed behind. So malnutrition, really undernutrition, we started seeing in the, in the elderly. Rape, psychological traumatic exposures became more and more common with this particular model, but epidemics were very, very few. And the reason being, was the public health infrastructure destroyed? Oh, yes. But the literacy rate in Yugoslavia, for example, is higher than in the United States. Despite how bad things got, people always remember to wash their hands, okay? So just a little bit of hygiene will, uh, will prevent that in those situations. So this is one study that was done, and they didn't do this purposely to go after this, but what they did in, in Kosovo was to uh, recognize that the crude mortality rate increased 2.3 times. That's actually a lot, small number, but that means it actually increased a lot. But it peaked during times of eth ethnic cleansing. And recognizing when they dis 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 disaggregated, it, it was males over, over 50 or three times, and, and then uh, males of draftable age were between about uh, 18 to 20. Well, you know, weapons coming in are, uh, they can't, uh, single somebody out. You should get what's, what your demographics are, okay? So what it showed and used, has been used in The Hague, is that that weaponry was used to kill the patriarchs of the family, okay? And also to kill the new draftable age males, all right? And that only came out because we did some studies like this. Iraq planning, I know you remember how busy I was, but some of the problems I had right from the beginning was I was a bit concerned about a, a, a possible humanitarian crisis. The reason being is between the Persian Gulf War and the onset of this particular war, uh, the infant mortality rate had gone up, under age five mortality rates had gone up, acute mal malnutrition rates had gone up, uh, mortality rates of, of, of people over the age of 50 had gone up, okay? Increase in reported cases of those things you see there, but during that time, WHO and UNICEF uh, had trained a lot of Iraqis to do surveillance. And so was this just because this is better reporting or what, okay? But certainly we had a problem. Another thing that I thought was very interesting and I put into my briefings before DOD took it out, but was the fact that the uh, acute malnutrition rate had gone from 3.6 to 11 in 1996, okay? It went down in four, to 4.1 by 2002. The reason being, however, was that UNICEF and WHO had to come in to do it. So even though they had some improvements in Iraq, they needed outside help. All right, that's going to tell you, gee, you know, you're going to need something in terms of the aid like that. But actually, this is one of my slides in the briefings I gave to DOD and CIA, but I was told to remove them, among some other slides, that this was probably not, not going to be a, a real problem. Uh, as we all know, in Operation Iraqi Freedom, um, a lot of trauma. But this is trauma we see a lot of space age medication uh, care for our, for our soldiers, which is wonderful. But the civilians 
uh, zero. And this is a country that really has no critical care capabilities, all right? none at all. So, um, you know, either they die right away, but one of the things with blast injuries is it affects the organs that have a water-air interface. So it affects the lungs, it affects the bowel, affects the ears. So we immediately go looking in the ears to see if there's any, if we see a ruptured eardrum of blood beyond the ear, zoom in any place that has critical care, we just admit them right away. But a lot of these people look good for about three to four hours and then go downhill very, very quickly unless they're on um, a lot of uh, high, uh, high level uh, critical care medications and, and equipment. One of the changes, however, and the epidemiology brings this out, is that there was a major shift from civilians dying from coalition action to insurgency action. In 2003, coalition-related deaths were four compared to one of non-coalition deaths. But by 2006, coalition-related deaths to non-coalition deaths were 26 to 30, or about one over one, okay? Now, this is known before. This should have, this is the kind of data in measuring the human costs of, of war, to should prompt some organizations, some people, to say, uh-oh, we got to change strategies. So this data was out there, no strategies were changed. But uh, this, of course, is telling you that something else is going on. Smoldering country model, uh, the, the, again, these are the, the Sudans and the Palestines and the Hades, but children grow up chronically malnourished, only know a culture of violence, little access to health care and education, struggle just to sustain any kind of health services. Uh, only the workers there, if you go to any of these countries, they call, most of them come from other African countries. And reproductive health, whether it's uh, medications, ketamine, or even uh, equipment for cesarean sections, or for that matter, birth control pills are a luxury that they don't even know about, okay? And this has been going on for obviously a long time. The other thing too is just, just this, this picture. If this was acute in the developing country model, so the, the conflict happens and all of a sudden everybody starts getting malnourished, dehydration, diarrhea. If a child that skinny gets it, they're laying out flat. They can't even raise their head. This child here is sitting up in the mother's arms, okay? And see how skinny that child is, okay? That means it's been going on for a long time. The other thing, this kid probably looks to many of you have children yourself somewhere around 18 months of age. It's this child's probably three, almost four years of age. Okay? So this is what you're dealing with. What it also tells us is that then an acute conflict event on top of this, very few of these children survive. They can't take much in the way of, of insults. Two million uh, plus now internally displaced in Sudan. But the important thing here is, you know, the mortality rate, 16 to 18 times the baseline. But also, you know, the violence, as I said, is only around 10, 11 percent, whether it's Angola, Somalia, whatever, of those that die from, from, from the violence, the machine guns, the AK-47s. But this was 49 percent, but just over a concentrated three-month period. So they were dying from these other things, the preventable diseases. Then all of a sudden there's a peak of increased deaths. Uh, because of the violence, and then when they get to Darfur, uh, to the refugee camps, then immediately they they start dying from the uh, uh, from uh, the malnutrition and the malaria and diarrhea and things like that. And again, excess mortality study uh, was was done there. And same studies, not debated. Everybody saying this is great. The initial Gaza West Bank studies that were done, actually three of them between '98 and 2003. All very interesting expose the fact that there is chronic malnutrition there with both macro and micro uh, deficiency diseases that really have not improved somewhat. But even some of the initial studies way back uh, that the, uh, the, that the uh, under age 5 mortality and infant mortality rates were similar to those of Somali and Bangladesh. Environmental deg degradation is high in most of this mo these models, the smoldering ones. But certainly an example of that is Haiti. Dominican Republic, all forests come across the border, nothing. Uh, it's gone from 40% down to 2%. Remember when the hurricanes came through a couple of years ago? Well, not too many deaths from the hurricanes. But over the next two to three weeks, 3,000 people died because of the flooding. There's not enough root structure to hold the water, okay? 
so what Haiti, you know, and I'm sure many of you have, have worked there, but the real question for us in the humanitarian community when you get down to that amount of deforestation is, is this a development kind of emergency or, or an emergency situation? I mean, we really don't have and the frustration that people go through and say, you know, I just don't know where to start with all of this. All right? Don't know where to start. Dilemmas, controversies, and factors that influence data. Let's go with this. This is the main part that I want to discuss with you. Really, the nature and the epidemiology, certainly, of armed conflict has changed substantially over the past 15 years. Um, data suggests that we really don't know the long-term effects of political violence on individuals, on communities, on ethnic groups, or tribes. We just don't know. We have glimpses of it some of which I've just told you about, but we really don't know the epidemiology of modern day conflict. And what we have from the Western world is, okay, we want to know about the battlefield deaths and when the deaths decline, and that's what everybody writes about. And yet over a period of time, and I'll talk to you about that, it's about 10 years, uh, some mortality actually increases in some groups, but it goes on for quite a while. <clears throat> Measures to protect civilians require really new protocols and approaches. They no longer fit the evolving conflicts, and certainly an example of that is the way that the, the Iraq war was approached. And as we develop more and more of an insurgency, the, the attempt was to just escalate the conventional approaches to it, okay? And obviously things didn't work. So it's, we are tied to something that's very conventional and has been with us for many decades. But in the absence of some evidence base, in the absence of epidemiology, the consequences of war really is an inact, inact, uh, inexact process and, and really uh, relegated to the estimates of political scientists and often military analysts. Yet we also he always hear about countries in crisis. You may um, call them something else. Really haven't changed. And mortality and morbidity, as I said, continue after the shooting has stopped. And I, th I think you probably all get this. I've gotten this for years. It pops up you know, two or three times a week on my email. And they have the uh, things for each month. December here, serious hot spots. You know, when we saw the complex emergencies declining and interest and funding declining, everybody saw these crisis countries are going to decline, but they didn't. I mean, it got down to 67, they went right back up, okay? And they tell you how many deteriorating, how many improving, not much change. Also, hunger has really climbed uh, by 18%. But an example here is, gee, how do we, how do we define hunger? Well, hunger among 180, uh, 850 million people is really um, uh, lacking food for basic health. A little bit abstract, not as concrete as, you know, you get shot and you're killed. Okay, but, but there's something there that we can measure, but it's both qualitative and quantitative. And another thing that should be uh, concerning us a lot is the fact that the agricultural and public health infrastructure has really declined over the past two years, two, uh, two decades. But not just uh, in the developing world, but in, in the developed world too. Uh, in, in many countries in China that increased their population by uh, a million every six months, it's ha absolutely outstripped the, the public health infrastructure. Um, and, um, and even, even uh, uh, Washington, D.C. is actually an example of that where many of your, your aquifer uh, infrastructure for, for water is the same that existed in the 1800s and hasn't even been touched since that time. So it is very fragile the world over. Security, big problem. Um, as you well know, but it always has been, but something we tend to deny. Remember Vietnam? Uh, when in Vietnam, uh, there were more USAID people in Vietnam during the war than there are in all of USAID today. Okay, it was big. It was big, okay? Uh, one of the things that was done for our military colleagues was that the military insisted they weren't going to go in and take over healthcare. They were going to train the population, train the doctors, train the nurses. And uh, so they were be building capability right from the beginning. But the, the MILFAP people and certainly the provincial medical personnel were earmarked for assassination and most of them were indeed killed at the end, okay, for cooperating with this. 
Now, when I went to, uh, as you know, I was the first American to go into Baghdad because of the looting. Um, actually, I had a slide for the CIA and the Department of Defense, which was slide number four, that I was concerned about the consequences of looting because I was the first American to go in after the first Persian Gulf War, and I saw this whole city of Dahuk uh, looted in a matter of eight hours uh, with everything, was stripped clean. So um, it, it's an art form in Iraq, right? Uh, they would put uh, United Movers or anybody to shame, but they can take everything out of it, right? But uh, when I went into Baghdad, I was supposed to meet with all the hospital administrators at the Palestine Hotel, and I chose not to. Uh, I told the convoy to go directly to the ICRC building, and where Marcus Dolder, who was a former colleague of mine and former mission director in Afghanistan before he came to Iraq, uh, uh, we had a meeting because I had to tell him uh, two uncomfortable things. One, we did not have the resources to recover the public health, which is required under the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, and, and two, uh, that we, as occupiers, we didn't feel that we had the obligation to. Um, what Marcus immediately told me before I even got to that, he said, Skip, after we exchanged pleasantries, he said, Skip, um, Sadr has already taken over a third of the hospitals, and his plan is to uh, take over social and health services to control the hearts and minds of the people. He used that term. I, hadn't, I thought that it was only the U.S. that used that term, especially from, from Vietnam, but he used it. Okay? Um, I didn't know who Sauter was until several hours later when I did have a meeting, and he barged in and stood about 10 feet away from... Uh, me in this room, I was right in the center, packed with all the hospital administrators, and gave me stink eye the whole time. Okay? He was very angry at them for not inviting him and for meeting with me. And there were some consequences afterwards, including a fatwa against me. So it was very, very important right from the beginning that they control the health services. Okay? A story that you don't hear about because... Uh, you know, not much mentioned. But how was that affecting the Red Cross? Well, the Red Cross, the ICRC building that I was at, was destroyed along with the, the UN building. But they were getting all these women coming in who were in labor because they were in Western dress. They had showed up at the hospital where they were getting their care. And if there was now a hospital controlled by Sadr, they were being refused. So they went, went to the Red Cross building thinking that maybe there was some health care providers there which there were not, okay? Military security briefs were fine during the war. Everybody was looking at the same thing. But as soon as the military security briefs um, occurred in Baghdad, there were still about the, the different military kinds of situations. But it had nothing to do then with the, with the non-governmental organizations. The security information had nothing to do that would help them with staffing or where they would put their their uh, their clinics and things like that. They were, it was just useless. So as you know, uh, the highlight of that was really at the UN bombing one because we had one security briefings that were from UNSECOR that actually uh, felt the, the problem was much, much different, much more difficult. Military security, NGO security briefings, none of them correlated, none of them talking to each other. And so it really is fine during a war situation, but once you get uh, to something like Baghdad and others, it was just not compatible for any humanitarian assistance. So in general, we're really unprepared as time's overwhelmed. And uh, we are struggling with this, okay? Now when I returned and I had to provide my brief to the person who took my place as the Minister of Health, um, I did it from a, a conference call you know, with the uh, Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense. So they had all these people on their side, and so the uh, ASD said, oh, uh, uh, Dr. Burkle, will you, why don't we start with you and you tell us what you think is going to be the biggest barrier for getting any health recovery in, in Iraq? And I said, well, clearly it's, uh, you've got a terrible security problem. Uh, and I think that's going to be the biggest barrier. Well, I was, I was uh, interrupted 
uh, by the person who replaced me, and he was incredulous. He said, security problem? Never heard of any security problem. There's no security problem in, in Iraq. And uh, so I didn't say another word and left the conference call a few minutes later. So, um, you know, it, it, security is a big issue. Um, it was a bigger issue in Iraq because of, I think, a lot of different reasons. But uh, we're always going to have it. It is part of the epidemiology and the nature of conflicts today, and we have to think about it. Excess mortality study in Iraq, you certainly know about it. Um, they are just population-based cluster sampling. The confidence interval seem to scare everybody. They disorient people. They don't understand what it means. But the point is this that somewhere between those numbers, you know, the 650,000 been quoted, well, you know, 395,000 is at the other end. It's probably closer to the 395,000 because they used, a, they used a lower baseline population rate and a few other things. But somewhere in the, those numbers, the confidence intervals, is the true number. That I think all of us who are epidemiologists and know what's going on uh, will tell you that it is. It's certainly much higher than the 150,000 that has been that has been quoted. Okay, a lot of things too has just been Baghdad centric, and um, that's not good when Baghdad is really just a fifth of the population. But a real problem for all of us is to translate these difficult concepts, which are very important data, and should lead to policy changes into some kind of simple speak. But also, you know, it's on the last page of the Iraq mortality study, is how the indirect deaths have sort of increased um, between 2005 and 2006. But I mentioned in that first slide, one of the first slides about the Iraqi planning. Well, in the first six months of 2004, in one government, they had uh, uh, 6,000 cases of, of typhoid fever. So again, if you take the lid, the public health lid off, it's going to happen, okay? Now, um, because I was the first American to go in after the first war, I was there when they still didn't have any electricity. Saddam was thought to be killed. Uh, he hadn't surfaced, okay? I was in Baghdad, and they had cholera, right? And they had cholera because uh, they had no electricity, the electric grids. They stopped the refrigeration, stopped the water, stopped everything, okay? But they had not had a case of cholera in over 20 years in Baghdad. Okay, but as soon as that public health infrastructure, the lid was taken off, zoom, endemically, nothing else was happening in, in Baghdad. As a matter of fact, there was not that much damage, okay, but all of a sudden the cholera shows its, its ugly head. So remember that when the public health infrastructure is extremely important. The mortuary counts that you hear about really have, and they play a role in sentinel surveillance, but they're not national estimates, but we've seen that. They've, they've extrapolated from that to, to say that the national estimates. No, 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 no. That's just as bad as some of the complications with the Iraq mortality study. Okay? You can't berate the military, however, for not counting the bodies. Okay? Um, it's not their mandate. But it's got to be somebody's mandate. Okay? But this has been one of the wars in which we don't have the UN presence, we don't have the NGO presence okay? to do this. And so all the problems around measuring the human cost of war, especially in the Iraq situation, we all deserve because we're just, we're, we're really guessing, okay, for sure. What happens when the shooting stops? Well, what does worsen is the two A's, access and availability to health care, especially prenatal care. Suicide, depression, alcohol, and drug rates all increase. Let me just give some examples. Afghanistan, Katrina studies uh, getting worse out-of-work males, IDPs. You know, we had among the most vulnerable populations during the Yugoslav War, women, children, elderly. When the war stopped, almost immediately, the most vulnerable population became the demobilized soldier. Okay? The other group also that had high suicide rates were now, because the fathers were killed, were adolescent males who all of a sudden became heads of households at a time when they really were dreaming about having an effect on the world themselves, all right? And I mentioned Croatia there, you know, of the Yugoslav countries, you know, Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, Croatia didn't do too bad, did they? And yet in the months after the war was over, there were 800 suicides by Croatian soldiers. Okay? You don't hear about those things, do you? 
Okay? Increase in gender-based gender violence, another marker that we use. Intimate partner rates as a marker of community breakdown okay? and economic and physical insecurity. Uh, the Congo, Iraq, Katrina, all of this has happened. Number of girls in school. They become the last to go to school, especially in an insecure environment, which again remains for years, or used to help support the family, send the males there. Delayed enrollment, very interesting, correlates with a high child mortality rates. And another fascinating thing is dengue fever. Dengue fever is one of the re-emerging diseases. Okay? We haven't seen so much since World War II. Where it's popping up is in countries that don't have good governance. Because when you don't have good governance, what do you end up doing? You stop picking up the trash. So all those styrofoam uh, cups, all the tin cans fill up with water. They're a great breeding place. Okay? And as a matter of fact, The Economist, you all know the magazine Economist, they independently, they didn't ask uh, the help from any of us medical types, but they were looking for a marker for urban decay. And remember, 67% of the population in Africa now are living in, 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 in cities. And as a matter of fact, humanitarian assistance about five, six years ago began to move from, from the rural areas to the, to the urban areas. But um, <clears throat> uh, it is the economists, of all the different indicators that they could use, and uh, economics is filled with indicators, isn't it? But what they latched onto was dengue fever as the most sensitive marker of urban decay. Okay, if you remember Yugoslavia, you know, beautiful country. When you're driving through there, the trash all over the place. You've seen pictures of Sadr City. Uh, uh, you know, we were thinking of developing a uh, an NGO called Garbage Sans Frontiers. You know, <laughs> that, that, that's probably the best best thing to do. Using dailies, though, and this comes from political scientists, not from us from the healthcare side, um, you know, found out that, gee, in, in these situations, yeah, not surprised, there's a, a raised risk of death and disability from infectious diseases. Okay, we will accept that. Increased risk through breakdown of norms and social order. Yeah, we, we proved that ourselves. Women and children, the most common long-term victims. Okay, we'll accept that. Also, surprisingly, that after the war is over, after the shooting stops, there's increases not only in the country that was at war, but in the surrounding countries. Okay? Increase in casualties far exceed the immediate losses from the Civil War, as a matter of fact. Okay? And examples of the suicides, intentional uh, deaths and injuries from other things. But the decay function, so after the war is over and then how, when does it come back to normal? Well, it takes about 10 years after the Civil War. A, a, a mega study done from CDAT, uh, the indirect deaths during the conflict, about 71%. Six months, this is average, six months transition period zipped up to 83% and dropped in this between 99 and 2005, dropped to 45 percent in late 2002. So it's with us for quite a while, and yet we don't really think about this, do we? Okay? And it, it changes. So what does restored health status really mean? Is it declining mortality or mortality and morbidity? Actually, morbi mortality and morbidity is much more sensitive than just um, mortality alone. And that's why we probably didn't recognize it until recently, because we were just looking at direct deaths again, okay? The important point when you're looking at your fragile states and your, your countries in crisis is, do they have uh, enough absorbing and buffering capacity to prevent that slippage back, okay? I think you don't have to go too far to have a good example of that, and that's Katrina. Half, only half of the physicians came back to New Orleans, and the other half that's remaining there, half of them want to leave. Okay? Uh, they've already said that there's at least a half a million people with untreatable mental health problems. So, you know, it's, uh, these, com these public health emergencies, uh, we don't have to go to Africa or Asia to, to certainly fund them. Indicators also for outcome. The impact, we all do that. You, you want that. Uh, Anne wants that for the smart, and we always look for that. But there's also indicators for function. Outcome indicators, however, are concrete. 
the deaths, the injuries. Functional will have some abstraction. So again, the example, basic food for health is functional, you know, some abstraction. It can be measured, okay, but a little bit, takes a little bit more creativity, causing death, which is the outcome, okay? You can do the same thing with the measles and then causing death, but, you know, the starvation child. It, it, but we haven't been doing that. We've been doing pretty much the concrete outcome ones. Function, functional indicators really are more important for indirect kinds of uh, situations. We need to define both of them better uh, with definitions, however, that are universally accepted, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Whoops, there we go. Humanitarian community, it took us a long time, I mean 20 years more, to convince the non-governmental organizations of the UN to use outcome indicators. All right? That's for sure. Political, military, and private sector really have steadfastly said, no, we're just going to use achievement indicators, which are indeed not evidence based. All right? And there's a conflict among the military definitions. And this has really been brought to my attention more by military people. Okay? If we just use the term measures of effectiveness, which I did pretty much most of the original research on, and there's a very strict definition for it, but the military has a totally different me definition for measures of effectiveness than you say it in State Department. So how can we transition? How can we talk to each other, okay? Unless we really know what we're talking about and we're talking about the same thing. Other factors, this is a big issue. International NGOs, yeah. I mean, why do we have them? Well, they focus on the beneficiaries, don't they, in certain sectors. And now the whole big thing is about clusters, all right? Gaining strength, close to food, water, sanitation, health, and shelter, okay? Human rights NGOs, well, they take on the legal issues and interview individuals at length. So they focus on the trees without judging the forest. I hope that's a good analogy. Academia, I'm afraid I'm in that, and Gabe is in that situation and others. But we look at the prevalence of health issues in a population, the forest. In the forest, we estimate the trees. And then the military private sector, they focus on completion, achievement of a mission. Can't blame them, all right? But they build clinics, they distribute MREs, all right? And that's what you get. When the Mercy went out to, to uh, Indian Ocean and all the rest, they come back and said, we saw so many clinic visits. Well, in the NGO community, we learned that lesson, remember, with Sudan Lifeline, okay? And the mistakes we made with with giving out all the, all the, uh, the uh, aid, you know, 263 million from the US government, and thinking, oh, we're really doing a wonderful job, until we found out that none of that was declining the mortality and the morbidity and the populations at risk, okay? So you just can't get away from it. You've got to be able to measure that, okay? And unfortunately, if you remember the history of even just the clinics in Iraq, you know, all these been rebuilt in the hospitals and things like that. Well, I still have a lot of colleagues in Iraq and we were exchanging emails, but what it really turned out until the inspector general got out there was that yes, some, a lot of them were rebuilt, but they just remained empty. If you don't have bandages, if you don't have medication. So that's putting form before function. Okay? But for them, they had done their mission. But here again is uh, uh, Sudan Lifeline. If it doesn't translate into improved outcome indicators, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. Tension between human rights monitoring and public health monitoring. Okay. Human rights monitoring requires what? Names, dates, witnesses for confirmation. If you've ever gone out to do any of those interviews. Public health approaches require population-based Truth, which almost always involves what? Pledges of confidentiality and lowering of the threshold of certainty. Well, public health estimates of rape are based on confidential interviews, which will always be higher than police reports. That's the way it is even in, in the U.S., okay? Uh, police see less than 10% of those things, and yet therapists and hospitals see a larger number, okay? Parties to the conflict, for example, military public health teams, which are are uh, being produced uh, every single day in large numbers, cannot and should not be doing such work. And making pledges of confidentiality, which their superiors certainly at some point must betray, but they're getting into the business. I worry about that. 
We need an international monitoring mechanism, uh, and that is critical, very much like the ICRC does with prisons and all the rest of the stuff. And yet, uh, they're, they're not part of the solution for the military, which is too bad, because the military needs to be part of this equation. Healthcare workers, I'll bring this together for you, and we're coming near the end. 57 countries now in a healthcare worker crisis. So it's become one of the crises for WHO over the last 18 months. Just look at Sub-Saharan Africa. 11% of the world's population, 24% of the world's uh, burden of disease, 3% of the workers. When I went to Liberia, there were 24 doctors, quote, doctors. Only 10 of them had medical degrees. Nurses, paramedics were out. They, were, they had just been elevated to the status of doctor okay, during that time. And I don't think many have, have returned. Certainly evidence has told us, too, that the intentional and unintentional injuries is rising, among other things, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Something that I want you to be aware of is the surgical burden of disease. It's really not been part of our public health model okay, at all. But it's approaching now, very interesting, almost 50% of the overall mortality in countries that we always saw malnutrition, diarrhea, malaria as being 50 plus percent. Increasing due to the fact that really we just don't have any surgeons anymore. They've left the country or they just don't set up it. So what we have is general practitioner physicians who will then, you know, they'll keep the patient for hopefully is go away, so there's late referrals leading to complications. Severe shortage of surgical and anesthetic services, resources and everything. But if you go to Africa now, for the most part, the surgery will be done by a non-doctor technician. They'll call him a doctor. They'll be supervised by a, uh, by a general practitioner for some of the complications. But they have technical skills that the general practitioners don't know about. And that is increasing, okay? Um, using the dailies, the political scientists, we have to begin to look at that literature, is now seeing this as a marker of social inequity and exclusion. It's highest in Southeast Asia, Pacific, and Africa, but among all the surgical things, the obstetrical surgical complications, which are just horrendous, uh, requiring surgery is much higher in Africa. Global disasters, so we're talking about the, the tsunami and the Pakistan and things like that. Well, for the most part, too often they've been imperfect, rather ad hoc, as you know, and politically motivated. But something interesting has happened with globalization. I think we all know that we can debate a lot about economic globalization, who it benefits, who it hurts, what directions going, things like that. But something else has happened during the entire time global health has come on the scene. And global health gang is here to stay. It has also brought great expectations about equity, transparency, accountability, okay, and in humanitarian assistance. I'll give you an example. As you know, what happened to in the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. They still have more money than they, they don't know what to do with, okay, and it's still coming in, okay. What followed was the Pakistan um, uh, earthquake, okay. So the journalist hopped over from, from India there, and this one journalist was talking out of breath, and he was going up to this primitive village on the top of a mountain. When you saw it, you realized it hadn't changed since biblical times, okay? And through an interpreter, they interviewed the, uh, the village elder who uh, had no teeth, uh, looked like he couldn't even give a you know, complete sentence. And what they asked him was, you know, well, what do you expect the world to do? Or the, and he spoke back, and when it was translated, he says, oh, I saw on the internet what everybody was getting from the Indian Ocean, and we expect exactly the same thing. So internet cafes are everywhere, okay? And the expectations are there, and that's what the world has been expected. So one of the things, obviously, that carried along has been the information uh, situation through the internet. And, and really, they're, they're, the expectation is indeed real. But the response patterns have changed since globalization. The UN, Red Cross movement, uh, leading humanitarian missions are now rare. Not in my lifetime, but they are rare now. The Indian Ocean tsunami, even though Ocha was there, Co um, uh, Kofi Annan went and said, please, countries, you know, give the money, uh, give the resources. Uh, 
Uh, you know, we always think that the UN has great stuff. OCHA has great managers, but they don't have helicopters. They don't have transportation. They don't have any of the supplies. They have to beg and borrow every single time. But management-wise, OCHA is the best we have, okay? But what happened was that the U.S.-led coalition, Australia, Spain, Canada, U.K., purposely bypassed the UN and the Red Cross and set up headquarters in Utapau in Thailand, okay? The beginning of what we see now is uh, U.S. military political command, so the commands like so the UCOMs and the PACOMs and, and all the rest, along with the World Bank, corporate contractors, and like-minded NGOs. Uh, it is indeed disaster capitalism. It's now being referred to in the literature as the relief and reconstruction complex. <laughs> Humanitarian work has become more politicized and militarized. Uh, certainly, n we have no one humanitarian voice, but um, we really do need a strengthened multilateral core that cuts across emergencies and development in both funding and action, no doubt about it. But um, something I certainly have been writing about for years, but public health must take precedence over politics. We can do what even the private sector wants by um, uh, demanding this, uh, nor can it be driven by political motives. Public health must be seen as a strategic and security issue. And I think our colleagues here from the military and others, you know, are saying that. They're working on it all the time. I mean, he's, he's been sent by the military to Iran to look at these issues. But if the military is going to approach it, they're going to approach it and say, well, what's the strategy about this, okay? But that part they are right on. We need to have a strategy about public health, and we need to ensure that it's, it is that it is, and there's a security component to that also. And it also deserves international monitoring system, which we do not have. We have some semblance of this with Sphere and SMART and CRED and ALNAP, and the list goes on and on and on, okay? And then the information things like Relief Web and all the rest, but they're all poorly funded. If they had been funded, we probably would be getting closer to some international monitoring kind of system. But we do need to do, uh, develop an epidemiology of conflict, which can certainly add science to the understanding of, of what we think we know right now about the human cost of modern day war. The future, well, this is what's happening, because I every day I train the young people to do. But you know, we always we even have sessions about defining a disaster. But what's the, what the disasters are turning out to be is the Indian Ocean kinds of things, and, and look, I'm a retired Navy captain, spent 31 years there, and the 1999 um, document about the way forward, they stated there that the U.S. has to triage and they will provide robust um, aid to countries, most likely those that are economically interdependent with. And indeed, that's what it was. They had people on the ground in Thailand and others within five to six hours talking about where they're going to build the new hotels and, and all the rest of the stuff because their feeling is if you get the economic system back, everything else including health will follow. Maybe not necessarily true, okay? Because I think there's a good example certainly in, in Katrina. But one scheme of disasters of those Korean countries economically independent with economic powers which will receive robust relief that rapidly recovers the economy versus disasters in poor countries which will depend on UN, UN agencies, Red Cross movement, all with limited funding and equipment. Okay, so that's really the new class. What's coming up also is, you know, by 2015 or so, we're going to have worldwide more people living in urban populations than rural populations. Wish I had a nickel for all the people I've trained to build defecation fields and pit latrines and all the rest. But you tell me, where are we going to put a, put a well here, okay? We really do not know how to recover or protect the urban public health, okay? Also, we're redefining public health. It is no longer medical care and, uh, and uh, health care. It is um, communication, transportation, judiciary, public safety, military, everything that allows a village, a nation, a country to function. But the mortality and morbidity that we're trying to measure really depends on the infrastructure. What's there? What's destroyed? What can be recovered? 
the moral integrity of governments because we do have examples like Yugoslavia and a few others where it's just been one despot or, or a despot regime that brings everything down. Okay? There's very little else. And so you have to decide, do you get rid of them or do you let it just occur? Because we do have studies now that show that for as long as you let the regime go on, they don't go, they may go to the Dayton Accords, but the psychiatry of the despots is that they cannot function in a peacetime situation. So we told them before, I mean, I remember being in a, in a, uh, in a conference where several of us said, oh, it's, you know, the, his psychology is he's, he's, he's not going to tolerate the peace. And he didn't. He went ahead and then invaded Kosovo. So they have to. They're driven to do that. And the capacity to provide sustained security. All of these things are what we're seeing. Again, we're not prepared to protect the urban public health infrastructure. Remembering, too, that multi-sector infrastructure assessments must be done. I was in Banja Luka. They asked me to come in and, find, and tell them why all these ambulante, these clinics that were built uh, outside the city by the NGOs that nobody was coming. Well, Banja Luka is a beautiful place, and there wasn't that, that much damage, but I got in the car and started driving around, and I turned this corner, and there's a distance of all these buses even behind me, about a quarter of a mile, and all the buses were destroyed. So you know why they weren't going to the ambulantes. There was no public transportation. So you have to do multi-sectoral multi, uh, uh, kinds of things. The other thing, too, is, is I found in so many of the people that I talked to in Iraq that were the planners, they just think that the infrastructure is the same throughout the world. This is a picture I got from Amara after the first war because Saddam sent me around in one of his last remaining helicopters for two weeks, and I... I saw everything. But this is the infrastructure, gang. This is the pipes for water. They're just under the surface. They're not like our infrastructure. And there's a puddle of water which you can't see, and that's when I traced it down. But that supplies the water to um, this fragile kind of infrastructure. So you need to know that infrastructure is not what you think it is. It's, it's quite different and unique for, for all the countries that we're in. Last slide. What we do need to know, and I hope you guys will fund somebody for it sometime, but one of the things that we do need to know about is what the hell is the conflict zone? What does it look like? Okay, uh, We have advances in, in GPS, enough to, to think about georeferencing data using GPS. Requires both the qualitative and the quantitative, so the direct and the indirect kinds of things. Public health data built into that georeferencing. It can be done defined by the population characteristics, where geographically violence is occurring, and human security indicators, which I know the military struggles with, and I guess you do with some of your military people now at USAID. But there are things. It's a wide range. Number of kids not attending school, kids not getting food, markets not functioning. They're not concrete, but they are indeed quite valid indicators. And this requires, all of it requires, some fairly accurate population estimates. So thank you very much. I'm not sure how much time I've taken here, but we have some time for questions. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Obviously, an awful lot to chew on. So why don't we go straight to the Q&A. And as I said in the introduction, we'll bring a microphone to you. And if you could let us know who you are and where you're sitting, um, that would be tremendously helpful as well. So who, who would like to kick us off? Okay, Charlie, over here. Okay. Oh, Allison, thanks. It's coming to you. Now, that was really fascinating, all those war stories. Um, the concept of excess mortality, I think it was, as far as I know, uh, we used it in the early 90s uh, when, in Somalia, when the troops left. We came in with a team from CDC. And I think you might have been involved, Skip, I'm not sure, but uh, I've really read your stuff. But there was a concept of excess mortality. And uh, one of the surprising findings uh, from, the, uh, from the survey that we did, the mortality survey was, or the question was, were more lives saved or lost by the humanitarian intervention? 
So I want to raise that issue uh, with you. Do you find that some humanitarian interventions, because of the delay or because of the fight over resources, actually raise excess mortality than, than decline? And if you can remember, the result of our study showed that actually excess mortality rose after the humanitarian intervention began. That's an excellent uh, question and observation. Um, I often think about that. Think about it, however, in context, too, with this decay function. You know, what's what in all of that? It is just, this is just what we would normally see because there's just no, no infrastructure left afterwards. But I think it's one of the most critical issues. Um, I think we can also apply that to the number of NGOs who decided to leave, for example, after the, uh, uh, the war in Rwanda and some of the, uh, the contiguous country uh, uh, camps because they were finding out that the longer uh, the war was continuing because actually the camps provided succor for many of the rebels. Okay, They would come there, uh, have food, sex, get equipment, and go out and fight. Um, and I think that has been a dilemma uh, for especially the long-term ones for sure. Um, I think as we get to explore the indirect deaths a bit more and um, even some of the decay function thing, and then begin to disaggregate that. We'll, we can sort of figure out whether, especially if those excess deaths that uh, that are um, maybe higher in those situations, especially in contiguous countries where we have continued the aid, but there's still some violence there. And then maybe could sort out how much is part of the decay function versus how much is is the observation you're made. But but you're absolutely right, absolutely right. And re remember, the aid has really been only directed towards pr stopping the direct deaths. Uh, absolutely. No, but uh, excellent observation. And boy, I mean, I hopefully people will start researching and writing about this, the younger generation, because there's a lot to be to be done about that. Thank you very much. Skip, thank you very much. It's wonderful to have such a broad overview with all your depth as, as well on this issue. You had mentioned uh, the military-humanitarian interface and had identified some of the perhaps different perspectives. But it's a reality that the military and the humanitarian response are not only differ, different, but they have to integrate in some way. Can you suggest, would you suggest some ways in which we could better coordinate between military and humanitarian response? Well, first, uh, yeah, uh, obviously um, one of the big things is we've got to start talking about the same thing. We've got to get definitions down. We've got to crack uh, the whole thing about uh, getting away from achievement indicators because, you know, I mean, look, military out there, great people. They want to do some great stuff. and. Uh, I've even promoted some of the kinds of NGO programs for them to to do, and they have done it. Um, and 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 then they've been able to transition to an NGO, and they say, "Wow, you know, this is, all, this is an orgasmic. This is wonderful." But without that, you know, the NGO comes on board, military runs and say, "We've done this one, that," and you know, they're kind to them, but they realize, "Oh my God, we have to start all over from the beginning because they delivered a lot of stuff, but we have absolutely no idea whether any of the people got better." So, I mean, that's a big thing. We've got to start talking as a humanitarian community because we we did include the military in the, as part of the humanitarian community before, and I think they should be. But right now, um, remember, military action is because of political action, so I don't know. You know, you can change administrations, then all of a sudden the military is, is, is given a, a less, a, a more focused role, not as big. Right now, Pretty much, along with the military contractors, military uh, um, anticipation is that they will do both relief operations and reconstruction. And uh, granted, you know that's treading on other people's um, territory, but they're also being told that well, the the NGOs and the UN are inefficient and ineffective. Okay. This is the way it was, certainly. I mean, I will tell you that I wish I had a nickel for all the times in Kuwait as one of the ministers in waiting every day we heard that, okay? And jokes about how the UN was going to disappear and the NGOs were going to disappear. 
uh, I would hope that there be enough people in the military uh, remaining after the Iraq war, if they get involved and continue to get involved, that would have recognized and, and felt some humble pie in this, that gee, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it was harder to do than they thought, okay? Uh, the corruption was there. Uh, the cost over ones were there. As a matter of fact, what's, it's making the UN and the NGO system seem very efficient and very effective, okay? But if you have the money behind it and that's not a big factor, then it will overtake it. The UN, the UN and the NGOs right now in the conferences I go to, they, they, they're saying we cannot compete with the U.S. military political approach. We, we don't have the money. We don't have the resources. Um, and it has become a business. Uh, and and uh, so, um, but there are situations where, you know, um, another political party might say, well, you know, that's not the role of the military to do. But we just don't know. So people are sort of reluctant. Should they get involved and start working with the, with the, with the military now, or will it go away? You know, uh, I certainly talk to as many military people who say, "This is I'm getting out of the military because we shouldn't be doing this nation building." You know, uh, so we have to decide what a role is going to be. The point from the NGO community, even from the people who did the Iraq study and all the rest, say, of course we need the military. Okay, we want to work and we have to work in some type of multilateral core kind of organization that has a universal voice, but really decides, you know, military should be doing these kinds of things for both security and maybe trying to keep, you know, the mortality, morbidity, and emergency phase from declining too much, much more of a public health focus and all the rest, transition uh, to some NGOs, UN agencies, things like that. But we're just not talking to each other on that in that realm anymore. We were, but that has disappeared. I mean, I really thought in my lifetime I was going to see something like that. But right now, it, uh, the bent is not to have the UN and the NGOs, except in these kinds of disasters where, you know, um, the Western powers are not interested in getting involved in. But uh, So it's scary. I mean, I think it's much more chaotic, much more disorganized, much more unsure about the whole thing. And... Um, if we go after it, if it happens and we just don't have any good data, just except for achievement indicators, boy, we've lost 30 years of, of good, good data sets. And that's even more, more disturbing. I, so. I just say parenthetically to that, it's interesting. I haven't looked at it closely, but the new uh, counterinsurgency strategy manual that has just been done is apparently um, by accounts going towards at least this strategy of hearts and minds and, and understanding that that's been very effective for their opponents and need to take that back, um, that mantle back. And the question is, do they view um, well, whether it, they're the right ones to do it or not, but do yeah. they view this kind of basket? Well, of remember, that was, that was part of the Marine Manual written in World War II, and that's they right. were great at it. And they did ago. great civil affairs. The MILFAP groups from Vietnam were great and things like that. What's disturbing, because that article that came out in the – in the press about that was that, you know, like they had reinvented the wheel again. You know, all they had to do was go back and look at their own data. The other disturbing thing is if, uh, and look, you know, I just finished writing the whole humanitarian assistance disaster relief doctrine publication for the Navy. Uh, big document, 250 pages and all the rest of the stuff. But in looking at all those kinds of pubs that, which, you know, those are the things that are on their shelves. And they refer to those all the time. This tells them, you know, okay, this is what we do, blah, 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 blah. But you never see in the references, you never see any references to what has been done in the humanitarian community, all the different studies. It's like they have to reinvent the wheel every time. So, yeah, we really need to start getting, communicating in some way. But if the political thing is, no, you don't, or we're trying to get rid of you, I mean, you know, the one, I, I, I see there are some NGOs that are obviously part of the political system and they're doing well. but. You know, the NGO system is going through a big change, and um, I'm not sure how many, some will probably start disappearing. We probably have too darn many NGOs anyways. I mean, if you remember in, in, um, <coughs> in, uh, in, some, uh, in northern Iraq, we had, uh, we had uh, 23 or so, and I was in charge of that for European Command. I thought it was a nightmare. But uh, when we got to Somalia, there were about 58. Um, 
than Yugoslavia, it varied between 350 and, uh, and uh, 300. Haiti, uh, 710, little Haiti, 710. But if you count all the little mom and pop shows, so, you know, a religious group, you know, one or two people, uh, not really registered, there were about 1,400. And Afghanistan, uh, there were about 4,000. We just don't know them. We just don't know them. A lot of, obviously, are coming the, quote, southern NGOs. I will tell you, when it, the other thing that Marcus Dolder told me when I went to the ICRC building, because I said, you know, what NGOs around here? And he, he listed a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, Muslim NGOs that I had never heard of, and they were certainly doing what he felt was a good job. But we don't know, and, um, and we should know what they're doing. Every, not we as a country, but the UN system, some data sets should know, so we can figure out what's done right, what's done wrong. So the expansion has been, obviously, in the, quote, what we used to call the southern NGOs, from developing countries. And certainly the major, quote, northern NGOs are working more and more with, in, in partnerships with many of these southern NGOs. But there are a lot out there that we, that we just don't know about. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I just wrote a, uh, an article for the Journal of International Affairs, Columbia, and um, just simply because the UN reform is going on, because we're going to lose this opportunity. But I really feel that we need to, um, reform and give tremendous strength to an OCHA-led um, uh, body um, that has all the supplies and the equipment. But it would also require that Article 43 that was part of the UN Charter in 1945 that was never implemented at all um, because countries like the US and others were just frightened about having a competing army. But it is interesting because military people uh, got their thesis through the Kennedy School on determining what the standing task force for the UN would would require, 50,000 people with 50,000 in reserve. So that was done by American, mi American military personnel, but they really need to have this standing task force under Article 43. Uh, Kofi Annan has certainly started to get the countries that will pledge peacekeepers but it's still a lag period, you know. Before he got the about 20,000 plus countries who said yes, we'll give them right away, uh, it was four to six months before anybody ever showed up in these countries. So, um, I mean, I think it's I think the consequences are scary without Article 43 being put in place and the UN having that capability. But that's just a pipe dream of mine. I just don't think politically it's in the in the cards. And without that. Maybe we will see the demise of any kind of UN and more towards the World Bank because, again, what they're convinced is is this going after giving aid, keeping people alive doesn't work. Let's get the economy back and everything else will follow. I don't think it's that simple, but uh, I think there's some interesting studies and look at there to, to be done. There's no doubt about it. And then really look at some kind of joint security kind of issue. Um, because that's, that's definitely, I mean, it started way back in, uh, in World War II, certainly was there in Vietnam, but now it's an art form. I mean, any kind of workers are going to have security problems. Any kind of humanitarian assistance will be, try to be disrupted. It's, it's the thing to do. Uh, and, and it does bring benefits to those who went out. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, Skip, um, yes. you know, there are certainly several people in the, there are a lot of people in the NGO world, and I, I think one of the authors on the Iraq study who believe that there really shouldn't be an interaction between the traditional kind of humanitarian community and the military, um, kind of the general feeling that it impinges on what was once a safe humanitarian space and the issues of neutrality um, and implications for security for humanitarian workers. Um, so I'm just curious to, to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, I don't that. think it's just that, that rigid and concrete. I think you can have the two bodies working together, not, not uh, <clears throat> with some, you know, collaboration is the word to use because, you know, you collaborate, you have differences, but you have to collaborate about some things like security and, and conflict zone space and all the rest of stuff. It can be worked out. We were getting to that. I mean, we were more than halfway there. 
but um, when in the interim, and it really started in northern Iraq with the Kurds, when the military started to do, you know, provide food programs, nutrition programs, things like that, and then it became sort of a territorial kind of thing. Uh, the problem was is that when something happened, then those programs ended, and there were no NGOs to sort of take the space. But I think it can worked out. But it really, part of it is for the political military will only do what the political uh, side says. So I think there's got to be going to be a congressional kind of understanding about what the military will do in these situations. Uh, and there's going to have to be some discussions and organization that hasn't occurred yet. Uh, it is possible because that's the kind of world we're in. It is much more insecure. So we do need it, but uh, I think you still can have your transparency and neutrality and all the rest with that. There's no doubt about it. And remember, remember the medical side of the military is covered under the Geneva Conventions. All right? So uh, that's, the, that's the part that we would be working with. And there's no conflict there. The ICRC has never had any conflict working with the military because we do the same things, okay? So they're different. They're, medic they're officers, but they're also physicians, healthcare workers, Any anybody who's a healthcare worker falls under those Geneva Conventions, and they're neutral. They can't be held as prisoners, um, you know, and all the rest of the stuff, but they have to also speak up and that's part of the issue too, is that they will speak up when something is not being done correctly and is hurting the civilian population. It's also interesting too, the Karzai just came out, you probably saw that just this past week, where he told the NATO troops, too many civilians are dying, okay? Now what does that mean? I don't know when you heard it, but when I heard it, I said, huh, indirect deaths. Okay, there's something, we don't understand this new conflict situation. It's something different. And when you put the weapons, conventional weapons and all against it, yes, there's a lot of collateral damage. There's, we've got to relook at this. There's something, something wrong going on here. Uh, and it, it, so that's going to take relearning. I mean, maybe it's being done in our military academies and others, but I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. But uh, we are in a totally different kind of conflict situation. And I just don't see the, the, the approaches to warfare, whether it's weapons or others, being compatible with, with, um, with, um, with, with the situation that is on the ground. It just is it's not. It's insane. Well, we hope to have an answer to that question. We're going to have 15 faculty from military education institutions here this spring, and we'll, we'll ask them. Yes, please. Why don't we hit V2 since you haven't had a chance and then we'll go down there. Hi, Skip. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I was just wondering, um, since complex emergencies last multiple years and um, not just with the military, but there are a lot of other agencies or organizations on the ground, what, what do you think and what are your thoughts about the relief to development continuum and the operation, operationalization of that? Well, that's a, uh, that's a great question. It has to do with what I'm saying, is that w we we got sort of tied up into just seeing, again, the death part. And and I think part of the step forward on that is to recognize the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the magnitude of the indirect kind of situations and start dealing with it. Uh, so if you if you do the way to see the continuum is to f uh, recognize that there are the indirect deaths that start, you know, se in that one study, seventy one percent, but it will will increase afterwards or whatever. We have to train people differently. I mean, I remember in Yugoslavia when we changed, you know, with the, the that that the NGOs, our big NGOs, they just said, hey, I don't do development. And I got up and left, and a new group came in. Uh, uh, that's the, that doesn't make sense also. So uh, it's, it's a big education and training issue. It's a big measurement issue. We've got to start writing about it. We've got to teaching about it. We've got to do a whole bunch of things to try to mitigate not only the direct deaths, the indirect, and see really what you need to do. But you do have to recover. There has to be a strategic plan, not just by the military, but by UN, NGOs, whoever involved it, of how to 
bring back all those things, the livelihood, the, the, the health infrastructure, all the rest. We don't have it. We are still just oriented towards the emergency situation because that's where the money is. It, it dries up quickly afterwards. So um, it is, uh, uh, the humanitarian community's got to get back into that. Um, maybe there still be just some NGOs that are just tied to emergencies, although there's development in some, both, but, and there's got to be money to, to uh, support all of that. We have more public and private funds than ever right now that's out there, okay? And yet everything is going downhill. And the reason why it's going downhill is that nothing's coordinated, um, only popular things are being funded, and the stuff is going, the resources are going in there, but there's no one to do anything with it. There's, there's, no, there's no physicians, there's no nurses, there's, there's no people who can govern and manage those programs. So uh, it's, and it's a shame because we've never had so much public and private funds, but it's not improving the situation. Microphone. Oh, yeah, go ahead, right here. Skip, I know it's one thing for us to talk about the number of deaths or vaccine preventable diseases or, you know, safe motherhood initiatives um, that have gone awry. But it seems to me that the greater burden ultimately is a mental health burden. And I wonder if we can draw from your psychiatry background in speaking to the smoldering effects of conflict that's unresolved or perhaps the veneer of peace and negotiation but underneath that an undercurrent of post-traumatic stress disorders, um, depression, schizophrenias, yeah. um, psychoses and so on that surface because the um, perhaps fragility of a system that kept those um, under control is now destroyed. It's hard I know to address the public health morbidities within a conflict and post-conflict setting. And it's hard to measure those things and it's hard to address them because they have long-term solutions. But what do you as a psychiatrist who has an experience in complex emergencies have to say or offer to that particular dilemma that we continue to face? Because this is often the substrate for resurfacing of conflicts or the long-standing conflict within the Middle East, for example. Well, I, I just finished writing a chapter for the IFRC book on uh, manual that comes out on this. It's very interesting because um, I, after I wrote it, it was changed quite a bit because a lot of the approaches are still, you know, people have their pet kinds of things and don't think other things working and things like that. Uh, so I think it was diluted, not to my satisfaction, but it was diluted. Um, you, you mentioned a number of things. For example, you have to when you look at the mental health issues, you know, across the board throughout all populations, there's almost the same percentage of people in any population that have organic psychiatric disease, okay? Schizophrenia appears in the same number, manic depressive disease and, and things like that, okay? Uh, what happens when this occurs is, of course, uh, and a lot of them are managed fairly well throughout the world, uh, even by communities and programs, things like that. But, of course, that's all taken away. Uh, the simplest thing to do is to bring in programs. And the best programs, quite honestly, are, are nurse-led programs that work in the community but get the antipsychotic medications back because they need that and get them tied to the community for rehabilitation and things like that. In a refugee camp, you've got to do it real quick because if there's psychotic people around, which there always are, it disturbs everybody. The whole, it becomes everybody's chaotic. Okay, so that's one part. You brought up the post-traumatic stress disorder. Certainly overdone. A lot of people generalize. I mean, one person came out and said, every child in Cambodia has post-traumatic stress disorder and whatever, and things like that. The interesting thing is that, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder has depression and it has anxiety components and whatever. Those are symptoms and signs that are universal also in every society, okay? But they don't necessarily all mean post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? Post-traumatic stress disorder, which is diagnosed quickly here, quickly there. I mean, we've had some people when I went into under uh, 
I was part of the uh, presidential de delegation that went to Kosovo to look at the, uh, the people's state of mind. And, and uh, BPRM had funded big programs that have people go in to take care, you know, stress debriefing. And these characters were there. They talked to somebody for one minute, come out and say, okay, this person won't get post-traumatic stress disorder. They were ha holding hands and having mantras with all the Kosovo saying, what the hell is going on? They were absolutely terrible, terrible programs. I think we're sort of getting away from that, okay, thank God. Because it, 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 when you have post-traumatic stress disorder, you cannot make the diagnosis for more than th any earlier than three months. And they really have the flashbacks and reliving things and all the rest. There's criteria under the DSM-4 that have to be kept to. That has been violated, so everybody has been talked about. But Paul Bolton stuff, when he has done ethnographic assessments, okay, because every country and culture has different terms for the same things, okay, they have found that, you know, who has depression, who has, who has post-traumatic stress, and then you can begin to deal with it, okay. The biggest problem, of course, is that we think of it from the Western side, which we recognize in psychiatry and in psychology, the intrapsychic individual. So I will sit with you and interview you and things like that. That's in the minority in the world. Everything in Africa and most of Asia is done by communities. And if you have a person even who is psychotic, you can't talk to that person individually. It will be, the family will give like a brother, or sis, a, usually a brother or elder, will come and talk to you and then that person will be the in-between. But that person will get better through community uh, recognized uh, resources rather than any individual kind of resources, okay? There's no such thing as one-to-one -one therapy or group therapy or things like that. If you look at, for example, depression with HIV, which is a big thing in Africa, okay? The depression is not, well, oh, geez, I got the disease, and I feel depressed, I'm gonna die, and things like that. They don't think that. Their depression comes from, I can no longer do my duties in the community. I can't work in the fields, or I can't do that, okay? If they get them back to do some work, or get them with ARVs so that they can work, they all of a sudden, the depression goes away. They're not necessarily that concerned about dying, okay? Uh, as we are, okay? So. The individual intrapsychic kind of approach just doesn't work. It's community approach. When the community's been destroyed or the, the refugee camp do that, we don't have any resources that can bring that back because our approach is an individual and it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all, okay? So um, you have to keep some semblance of the community intact. Uh, you have to train indigenous nurses to run these programs. They, they have worked well in Africa. Um, the psychiatric model doesn't make a lot of sense, except for the psychotics, okay? Um, and that's fine, you know, and you can train people to do that. These drugs are very simple. They're simpler drugs than what we use in the Western world. You don't supp supply new drugs because they can't be maintained, okay? Um, so, I mean, I could talk for hours on this, but you understand, we, we're losing, we certainly have lost the ground from the mental health stuff. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, but the, the, the depression and the anxiety, a lot of somaticism, okay, that is the most common symptom that you see out there. Is people internalize it so it comes out as physical symptoms, okay? That was in the Western world, that was present during Victorian times, okay? But that's the way it is in the, in the developing world. That's what we see most of. And uh, if, we, if we have to substitute that for something that they feel good about or whatever, and then that goes away. But it's not, it's not by sitting down and talking to them at all. So it's got to be community-developed programs. And that's going to take a lot longer than since, you know, it has to be built and it has to be long-term. And it also has to be tied with social services and economic services, like in Yugoslavia, they had the people see the psychologist, the social worker, and um, uh, a person who would take care of, you know, uh, getting them some money and a place to live and whatever, all of those things. And a lot of it then got, got you know, they got back on their feet, but not from individual uh, therapy. That was never, has never worked well in these, in these groups at all. Thank Katrina, you. as I said, already has five, a half a million people who are, you know, Whatever, I'm sorry. I, I could talk for hours, but I'll send you the article, okay? okay. That would be I think we have a f uh, time for a final question. Yes, please. 
Thank you, and thank you very much, Skip. It's quite interesting uh, to hear what you're working on. Um, I just wanted to ask your thoughts on a couple of points. One is you mentioned this uh, potential future sort of dichotomy of working with the countries where we have economic interests and kind of, you know, a lower end solution for other countries. But I wonder in the context of things like avian influenza, whether in a more globally connected economy, whether that dichotomy will persist. Sometimes I don't think it's very uh, realistic. No, the, the and okay. can I just throw out one more question and then give you time to talk about both of them? Um, you mentioned something which to me is quite ironic when you pointed out that, you know, in Vietnam we had more aid staff than in the whole agency. I don't think everyone would interpret that as a sign that there were major development efforts going on. I think that there's potentially always the risk that uh, humanitarian and relief and development efforts can be co-opted for other purposes. And so, um, even one of the things that we're working on, I sometimes am a little concerned about, you mentioned the importance of getting better information for public health. But as we improve our public health information and we get G geo, uh, yeah. uh, GIS systems for, you know, we know all the infrastructure, we know the elevations, we know where people live, we know what's there, and we make that information widely available. Are we putting people at risk of other consequences? Well, let me answer the last part. I, I think yes, um, but we. I think the main thing is we. There'd be probably some information that we wouldn't share, you know, uh, so wouldn't get out. But simply because we just don't. We need to understand and better define the conflict zone, which we don't know. Okay. But let me go back to the first part because it is fascinating, the whole avian influenza, but, but what we call right now bio events, because uh, whether it's it's smallpox, bubonic plague, avian influenza, anything like that, we. You know, for, for weeks we don't know what they are. You know, uh, West Nile fever, uh, monkeypox in Kansas, and, um, and SARS were all thought to be bioterrorism events for a couple of weeks before they were found out that they were just naturally occur occurring or re-emerging diseases. The, this is a model that we should all be aware of, but because of what happened with SARS and the fact that China kept it quiet and, and all the rest, and it actually increased the transmission of the disease. And as you know, it went from Guangdong province to 40 countries in 10 days, okay? Well, WHO during that time was in a very passive um, position. They, could, they heard rumors and all the rest of the stuff and told China, look, you know, can we come in? We've heard this, no, it's not true. It delayed and delayed and delayed. And when they finally got into Beijing, um, uh, the, the Chinese actually took all the cases of, avian, of SARS, for example, uh, and put them in ambulances, buses, and taxis and drove them around Beijing uh, for all the time the WHO team was there. So the WHO team only saw a few cases and said, oh, there's no, no epidemic going on here. Okay? Well, that's, that really got everybody concerned. There is a World Health Assembly. You probably never heard about it because they don't do much but they are all the ministers of health uh, throughout the world. And uh, they got together and they said, oh boy, are we in trouble. And what they did is they gave WHO tremendous, tremendous authority all of a sudden. Authority to go into any country at this point because what they recognized was that what was happening locally had immediate international effect. And so sovereignty, We'll respect it, we'll ask you, and we'll volunteer, but damn it all, we will go in if you refuse. So we're trying to recognize your sovereignty, but the, the, the international health took precedence over any one nation's sovereignty. Now this, and that was the reason why they actually uh, uh, contained the SARS. And remember Toronto, which is, was like an island, but certainly it was lots of heavy density all around it, but they were able to quarantine that place. Toronto went bonkers. Uh, but it, the, in, the reason why they did that was to keep everybody around them from getting it because that's the Achilles heel of any infectious disease is to keep it from transmitting to somebody else. So with that, they, they did an international health regulation, which was uh, 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 essentially went into effect 2005, passed into effect of 2007, um, and that was an extension of what 
the World Health Assembly did with WHO. WHO has tremendous powers. They are totally in charge. Surprising that they do. And they, is, they can, they, they, they will take charge and stop any kind of infectious epidemic like avian influenza. There's a model there that we should use, but we would have to also think, gee, that's what the UN should be doing, okay? And you can easily extrapolate from that to natural disasters or large-scale disasters, giving OCHA, for example, uh, that kind of, kind of control. It works for WHO, and everybody's agreed to it, but it's not in place for anything else. But that's a model that we have to begin to look at. Well, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it, but we covered an awful lot of ground, and we really appreciate the insights you bring from scholarship and practice on the ground, boots on the ground. So thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure.